So um, if we want to speak about uh, computational modeling of the brain, we have to look at the notion of uh, the brain as a computer, maybe. Um, it's one aspect, it's one's perspective on, on the question. In the notion of uh, computational modeling of the brain, there is this idea that the brain can be um, you know, identified as a computer or could be reduced as a computer. So we can discuss about that uh, philosophically and, uh, and technically. But if we simplify things and looking at a the computer, there is the hardware part and the software. And I think it's not exaggerated to say that the hardware part of the brain is relatively well understood. And we understand, for in instance, the architecture of uh, uh, the organization of the brain as a structure, as, a, as different elements in, at different scales. And in that respect, there is a, a great deal of uh, efforts in research these days of uh, implementing this architecture using um, simulations on software, but also actual implementation on uh, computer chips, which uh, architecture is actually that of uh, elementary assemblies of uh, neural cells. So we call these uh, approaches neuromorphic in the sense that you really want to, or you proceed to implementing um, an architecture in a substrate that is not biological, that really mimics uh, the brain. And then you would hope that by using this uh, uh, these architecture, you would learn about brain function, or you would basically uh, proceed at, um, or you would obtain results that would be, um, you know, at least equivalent to in performance to that of the brain. And the performance is uh, both in terms of um, computational power, which is, uh, I think we can agree, quite high for the, for the brain, but also in terms of efficiency. Uh, and I, I think it's even the greatest attraction. Because uh, to give you an idea uh, in terms of computational power uh, of uh, reduced to the number of operations that uh, the brain is able to perform, first we need to look at um, basically the number of uh, little components that uh, can perform operations. So, of course, we think about neurons. And so typically in the human brain, there, is around, there are around 100 billion uh, neurons. But it's not only the neurons that perform the computation. You can even reduce the elementary computations and operations to that of the synapses. And every neuron is typically uh, interconnected with other neurons in the order of 1,000 to 10,000 synapses. So you multiply 100 billion by about 1,000 or 10,000, and you end, up, you end up with a quadrillion of elementary operations that can be performed by the brain, and it's at a, a certain moment. And uh, the brain is extremely dynamic and can, can perform anywhere between maybe 10 to 100 of uh, operations per second. So we are looking at the capacity uh, of the brain as a computer uh, uh, around 1 to 10 peta pentaflops. So it's 10 to the power of 15 uh, elementary operations per second. And um, today's uh, high-performance computers uh, they are barely reaching, or maybe they have sur just recently surpassed that, um, that capacity of performing elementary operations per second. Um, so we are talking about, I think, the, rec the world record is around 50 to 55 uh, uh, petaflops uh, on the latest uh, supercomputer. So it's not so much um, an issue of you know, how many operations can be performed. It's also a, a matter of uh, efficiency. Um, and um, in terms of energy that is um, consumed. And uh, if you look at uh, these high performance computers and super compu computers, um, like the, the one I was alluding to, uh, I think requires an energy supply in the amount of about one to five megawatts. So it's completely crazy when you compare uh, the efficiency of the brain for the same amount of operations in theory, uh, and at least in terms of capacity for operations. And the human brain can 
uh, you know, uh, require basically uh, an energy supply that is equivalent to a light bulb of 10 to 20 watts. So we are looking at things that are tremendously um, uh, different in terms of efficiency, uh, which makes it uh, um, very puzzling for you know, computer, sh computer scientists to uh, basically try to mimic this uh, extremely powerful object uh, that is able to perform so many uh, elementary operations at once uh, with a very limited uh, uh, supply of energy. So in that respect, it's very fascinating, and it's, a, it's one trend of research in the computational modeling uh, of the brain. It's actually trying to use the brain as a model for a computer. So it's like the, the reverse, but very it's two sides of the same coin. Um, whether we're going to learn about brain function by implementing a brain in silico, that's a, a different um, uh, question. I guess maybe yes. But like I said, uh, one of the motivations to develop these neuromorphic uh, computing solutions is to reach a greater efficiency in terms of energy um, needs. Uh, then, if uh, these, uh, these solutions exist and are available, and then I guess neuroscientists may use those uh, brainy computers uh, as uh, models uh, that they can basically observe and they can... Um, uh, where they can also implement, you know, or test hypotheses about brain function and dysfunction. And you can look at the way, uh, you know, the functions of this brain uh, in silico would be altered by modifying some of the parameters and understanding, basically, uh, whether that would lead to be pseudo-behaviors uh, that, are, that are that observed in some patients, for instance. And uh, you could also implement some, um, you know, models for brain repair as well. So that makes it very attractive and an alternative to the current, uh, you know, practices in, in biological research, which are relatively limited uh, in terms of testing this kind of hypothesis, because you have to look at animal models, which are very imperfect. Um, uh, and also you have to look at patients, uh, and, but here again, and obviously, the uh, different solutions to treat a given patient are relatively, I would say, limited, because you are dealing with a person and not a computer, so you, you don't want to make mistakes, obviously. Um, so that's one way of doing things, of uh, modeling the brain as a computer. And so there is this hardware portion, but there is also this, uh, the software uh, portion that is uh, also the object of a lot of, uh, you know, very active research uh, everywhere. And there is, for instance, the, the Human Brain Project uh, in the European Union that has triggered a lot of interest and which uh, one of the deliverables and objectives is to actually implement a, a, a software version uh, of the brain where this time uh, there is no implementation in silico but more uh, as, a, as a software program that would basically model every single cell, maybe not in the brain, but uh, in, uh, in some brain regions, for instance, the olfactory system or somatosensory system uh, of a rodent that was published actually last year, for instance. And the approach they are taking is actually to mimic or to implement equations, if you will, for each and every single cell. And the way these different cells interact also is modeled with uh, uh, some uh, software modules. And basically, you have a supercomputer uh, run this software. And um, you can also do proceed the same way I was describing before by you know, observing the end product of this um, brain activity that emerges uh, spontaneously or is altered by a pseudo stimulus that you can also model uh, with software. So this is also very interesting, very flexible, and um, and also uh, opens great perspective in terms again of uh, you know modeling uh, brain functions and dysfunction. Um, it remains uncertain whether this can scale up to uh, the dimension and complexity of a whole brain, um, and whether we're going to learn about uh, how the brain uh, you know. Uh, uh, implements uh, basically function and behavior. But uh, this is definitely a, a very active field of research in neuroscience. Uh, and there is also yet another side of this uh, 
computational aspects that relate to brain function and um, and brain uh, brain activity. And this is, uh, you know, the bridge with um, machine learning techniques uh, that have been, you know, exploding over the past uh, five to ten years. And it's very interesting to uh, to see a little bit of history of how these uh, techniques have developed um, and uh, have gone through a renaissance uh, recently. Because back in the 1970s and early 80s, there were these pioneers in in computer science and also... Um, you know, uh, mathematics, who've looked at uh, basic models of neural networks and at the mathematical for, uh, formalization of these networks. And um, this research has uh, been, uh, you know, kind of suspended or didn't get too much traction um, in the industry and the rest of the neuroscience community, because basically for these networks to, you know, perform properly in terms of classifying uh, images or um, translating natural language, or uh, even the capacity of learning for these networks, it, the, the, they were limited by two factors in, uh, back in the 80s, 1980s. The first factor was basically um, the limited power of uh, computers, and, uh, or if you wanted more computational power, it was really, I mean, it was very difficult to, to access this, um, these resources. Uh, which is not the case anymore. And the second aspect was that for training these networks, you had to uh, have a lot of data available to you, like uh, thousands and thousands of images to basically, uh, for the network to be able to classify uh, the different elements in the picture, um, a face, uh, an animal, uh, or even you know higher order kind of categories. And this is not the case anymore because data is basically out there and um, huge databases of um, you know classified um, uh, images, but also sound bites, um, and also um, other other uh, objects of interest are readily available on the internet and um, and have been created over the years. So today uh, we are looking at this revolution of uh, machine learning and. Um, how it can penetrate basically the industry and uh, and um, you know consumer goods, and um, but the question is okay, is it really um, um, uh, a translational aspect of neuroscience, or are we going to learn about how the brain works with machine learning? As of today, I don't think that's the case. I think uh, in that respect, um, I mean the implementation of machine learning is is very remarkable and is is full of promises, but also poses some uh, uh, soci societal and ethical challenges. But um, if you look at just the scientific portion of it, you would hope that by observing these neural networks uh, in action, uh, by performing classification you know, on series of images or translating natural language, you would learn how the brain does that. Um, and that's not the case because uh, it's, although... Uh, the architecture of the software mimics that of the brain networks, yet the mechanisms by how these uh, software bytes, you know, bits um, realize this function uh, is not clear, meaning that you, it's very hard to generalize and to understand the mechanisms of, that have been implemented by the network uh, to perform uh, uh, even with very high performance um, a, a given task. So in that respect, you don't have the insight of, you know, um, looking at uh, the implementation of a given function, and therefore you cannot bridge uh, that with um, uh, the, uh, the actual uh, brain activity that may be observed uh, in humans. So, but taken together, I mean, with the um, emergence of uh, new mathematical tools, but also, you know, the... Um, the uh, the immediate access to huge uh, amounts of data and also computer resources. I mean, all the elements are, are in place to basically um, approach this fascinating question of, you know, a better understanding of uh, brain activity, brain function, brain dysfunction, uh, with basically new methods and new resources that we didn't have even uh, recently.